Hello and a happy Easter from Emmanuel Baptist Church in Falmouth. This is our Easter service. We did a live stream service this morning, but we had a few technical glitches, so I thought I'd re-record to make it run a little bit more smoothly. A very special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time, or you're just intrigued to see what's going on. I pray that you can stay and listen as we share about the greatest day in history. I hope you've had time to get outside and enjoy the weather. I've managed to do my exercise on my bike, but I've also sneaked my GoPro with me and took some pictures, such as the sunrise that you would have seen at the start of this service. I hope you enjoyed that. A couple of notices for you. If you'd like to share your Easter Sunday photos with us, you can email them to communication at emmanuelbaptist.co.uk, or if you have Instagram, you can tag us with the handle at EBC Falmouth. During this lockdown period, we will be continuing to do our live streams on YouTube on Sunday morning. You can search for us, just search for Emmanuel Baptist Church Falmouth, and you can also subscribe to us. Charles is continuing to do his sermons. We're not adding them to the live stream. Um, he'll do a 10 minute talk today, but you can find his full sermons on our website, or on Spotify or on Apple Music. Again, search for Emmanuel Baptist Church Falmouth. We're gonna start our service today with an uplifting song led by Lee, The Greatest Day in History. Cross 
we're now going to listen to today's reading read by Daisy. Thank you, Daisy. This is a reading from John 20, verses 1 to 9. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the entrance. She went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and told them, They've taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Then Peter and the other disciple went to the tomb. The two of them were running, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and saw the linen wrappings, but he did not go in. Behind him came Simon Peter and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there in the cloth which had been round Jesus' head. It was not lying with the linen wrappings, but was rolled up by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture, which said that he must rise from the death. Then the disciples went home. We're now gonna watch a children's talk from Fresh Church. They've kindly let us use this. Um, it's explaining Easter using Easter eggs. Enjoy. My daughter Abby is getting very excited. You see, Abby loves Easter. She loves chocolate, eggs, the little extra mini eggs that you get. She loves the hot cross buns. In fact, Abby gets very excited about Easter full stop because it is a very exciting time but actually it's not just exciting because of all the chocolate it's far more exciting than that. Easter is all about an extraordinary man. An extraordinary man who did extraordinary things and his name was Jesus. The people absolutely loved him. They had seen him do some extraordinary things They'd seen him feed 5,000 people. They'd seen him calm a storm. They'd seen him make blind men see, a paralysed man walk. And they'd even seen him bring his friend Lazarus back to life. Wow, extraordinary. And on Palm Sunday, we remember the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey with the crowds going wild at this extraordinary man who they'd seen do such amazing things. And they ripped the branches from the trees and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow! But there were some people in that crowd who didn't shout. They didn't cry, Hosanna. They didn't like him. They didn't get him. They were like hard-boiled eggs. They didn't understand the things that Jesus was saying about God. They didn't understand the stories. They thought they knew everything there was to know about God already. And Jesus was really challenging their thinking. He turned things upside down. He said that it's better to give than to take away. He said it's better to love your enemies. And even one of Jesus' own friends, one of his special friends called Judas, got really confused. I thought that this Jesus hadn't come to do the things that he thought he was going to do, like fight the Romans. And Judas turned into a bit of a bad egg himself. So much so that he decided that he was going to sell Jesus, if you like. He would tell the authorities where Jesus was going to be. And that's exactly what Judas did. And had him handed over, Jesus was arrested and taken to the Roman governor, Pilate. Now Pilate, well, he was in a tricky position because Pilate couldn't see what Jesus had done wrong. He really didn't know what to do with him, but the religious leaders were shouting that he had to get rid of him, he had to kill him. And so it was like he was walking on eggshells. He really, really didn't know what to do. But then, as the crowd were being egged on, by the religious leaders and told to shout crucify him. The same crowd that had shouted Hosanna only a few days before were now being egged on. Go on, if we give you money, shout crucify him. They were bribed, they were egged on and told to shout to get rid of Jesus. And in the end, Pilate felt there was no escape. There was no other way. He had to get rid of Jesus. He didn't want to let the people down and Jesus was handed over. But where was 
with his friends. Well, they turned into a bit of a group of scrambled eggs. And Peter was the biggest scrambled egg of all. They were scared. If that's happened to Jesus, what would happen to us? Peter, big brave Peter, who said when Jesus told him he was going to die, said, I'm not going to let you die, Jesus. If you die, I'll die with you. When he was asked if he knew Jesus, three times he said, I wasn't his friend. I don't know who you're talking about. I wasn't with him. He turned out to be the biggest scrambled egg of all. And Jesus was led away by the Roman soldiers to be executed, put to death on a cross, which was the cruelest form of death that the Romans knew how to put on anybody, on their worst criminals, and yet Jesus hadn't done a thing wrong. The religious leaders wanted Jesus to be an example, an example of what happened to somebody who went against the authorities, who said things about God that they didn't believe was right. But what they didn't know was that God was wanting to use Jesus as an example, an example of his great love for us. And even though Jesus had done nothing wrong, we do things wrong. I don't know about you, I make a mess all the time. And that's why God sent Jesus to be an example in our place for the things that we have done wrong. The friends were devastated. They thought that that was the end of their best friend, Jesus. But three days later, to their absolute amazement, Jesus came back to life and some of them saw him. But one of them wasn't there. And when they tried to tell Thomas that they'd seen Jesus, he's alive, he's not dead anymore, Thomas turned into a bit of an egghead. I want facts, I want evidence, said Thomas. Unless I see Jesus for myself, I'm not going to believe it. But then one week later, when they were all together and Thomas was with them, Thomas wasn't an egghead anymore because Jesus came into the room and Thomas fell on his knees. He had all the evidence he needed. Jesus, his best friend, was alive. Wow, Easter is exciting, Abby. And I know you like hot cross buns. And I know you like the Easter eggs. And that is all really exciting, but actually, Easter is all about the extravagant love of God. The love that God has for us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die in our place. That's an exciting story. Thank you, Mary and Abby, for that Easter extravaganza. Actually, some of you may recognise Abby, as she used to be a student in Falmouth about three years ago. Now we're going to worship again and Dan and Rachel are going to lead us singing You Are Mighty from their back garden. You are mighty, you are holy, you are awesome in your power, you have risen. You have conquered, you have beaten the power of death. Beaten, 
It's testimony time. Each week we hope to share a testimony from one of the members at Emmanuel Baptist Church. This week it's Chris. Thank you, Chris. Um, I was brought up in a Christian family. Um, in fact, I came to Emmanuel in 1969 because I had to come because mum came here and made me come. Uh, but obviously you can't inherit Christianity. Um, you've got to discover it for yourself. And I've always felt and uh, known there was a, a God and um, I've prayed, but I've normally just prayed when things have gone wrong in dire straits, times of trouble and that. Um, you know, just calling on God when I really needed him and then just kind of blanking him the rest of the time. Uh, the great thing is he didn't give up on me. And looking back in hindsight, um, I see many occasions when God was working in my life. Uh, when my mum was uh, dying in, in Trelisk, um it took a week for her to pass and uh, I was really sad and um, I was really angry with God to be honest um, so on the one hand I was really angry with him um, and on the other hand I was very grateful to him for um, giving me such wonderful parents and, and I, was, I always remember my grand saying you know at the end of each day count your blessings and name them one by one so I was aware of God I was aware of Jesus but I put them on hold really and when mum was dying as I say I was angry but also very grateful and I thought either I'm not going to bother or I'm going to try to make a difference and let you know God and the Holy Spirit work in my life and that's basically how it happened and I suppose my only sadness of course it's God's timing but I wish that um, you know that I'd um, given myself to the Lord a lot earlier um, but hey Hopefully he's still got time to do some stuff <laughs> with him, for him, through, you know, it's, it's wonderful, you know, I thoroughly recommend it. God our Father, amazing. That's all I've really got to say. We're just going to spend some time in prayer now. One of our youth have written a prayer that they would like to share with us. And then we're going to be led in prayer by Rachel. Hi everyone. Um, I've really enjoyed the videos that people have been sending on Bus Group, so I decided to do a prayer and send it to Bus Group. Dear God, please help the coronavirus to stop. Help the people to be safe again. That everyone could be out and about and doing what they used to have fun doing. Please help the people, the nurses, the doctors and the care homes and also... Um, the NHS to help us to be safe and save lives. Amen. Good morning, you lovely lots. I'm going to leave us in some Easter prayers this morning. I'm going to start with the jelly bean prayer for our junior church. So when you see a colour, shout it out and let's see if I can hear you from my house. Are you ready? Red is for the blood you gave. Black is for the empty grave. Yellow is for the shining sun. White is for new life begun. Green is for the grass and trees. Purple for your majesty. Orange for the edge of night. And pink is for the morning light. Lord, draw our thoughts upward to you every minute of every day, but especially this Easter. Help us resist the temptation to focus on the painful things of this earthly life. And learn to control our thoughts so they don't sink our faith and our joy in you. Thank you for the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Lord, we want to celebrate him every day of our lives. In a world that feels dark, help us hold up his light. Give us the courage to speak boldly and never be ashamed of proclaiming your good news. Let's take a minute to lift up those around us who we know are suffering and need our prayers. Maybe you want to just call out their name where you are and lift them up to the Lord.
This Easter Sunday, let's lift up the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Drew and Ali are now going to lead us with some worship, singing O Come to the Altar. Oh, 
this Sunday. Um, it's amazing to think back to what he did on the cross. He is an amazing saviour. And um, even in this time where we feel uh, captive, um, we know that we are free. And, um, and that freedom has brought us strength, it's brought us peace, it's brought us joy. And on this Sunday, we pray um, that we would remember those things. That after Jesus died on the cross, that he sent the Spirit to be with us. And we praise him for that. We praise you for that, Jesus. Amen. We're privileged to have two testimonies this week. Charles, our minister, is also going to share his testimony and explain why Easter is so important to him. Thank you, Charles. I'm standing outside the church in the church garden and I want to give a message for this very special day, Easter Sunday. And the message is based on three parts really. One, I want to tell a story. Secondly, I want to give a testimony. And thirdly, I want to give a future hope that I have. First, the story. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, there was a radio programme called The Brains Trust. And the programme was very much based on the, the similar format to what we see today in our Any Questions. There was a panel of experts and then a chairman and then questions from an invited audience. Now, a regular appearance as a panellist came from a man called Professor C.J. Joad. And he became quite famous from this programme because he was quite a, a humorous man and a very witty man, and obviously, obviously, being a professor, a very clever man. And whenever he was asked a question, he would answer in this way, well, it all depends on what you mean by. So on one occasion, this question came to the panellists, and it was this. If you were to ask a question and you knew that the answer you would give would be a totally factual, honest, trustworthy answer, what question would you ask? Now I'm just going to pause there for a few moments and ask you to think about that question for yourselves as well. Well, when it came to Professor Jode's turn to uh, put his question that he would ask, he said this, I would ask the question, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Now, the uh, chairman of the panel got a bit edgy about this particular question because it's taken the programme into a bit of a, a religious direction. But he, he managed to cope with the, you know, the, that kind of thing. And uh, he then asked Professor Jode, why do you ask that particular question? And Professor Joad said this, because if Jesus did rise from the dead, it changes everything. And that was a brilliant answer, because he's right. If Jesus did rise from the dead, it does absolutely change everything. Now, Professor Joad, at that moment, when he asked that question, he was not a Christian. But later on, he did become a Christian after studying evidence for the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. We've been going through, in the Book of Acts, a series of studies, and I hope you have noticed that the, the resurrection, the preaching of the resurrection, is central to Paul's gospel preaching. And Professor Joad went away and he looked at the evidence for the resurrection and he found it all made sense and he became a Christian. Easter Sunday has a very special place in my heart for obvious reasons, Jesus rose from the dead. But also it's on an Easter Sunday was when I first, as it were, committed myself 
to Jesus as my own Lord and Saviour. I'd like to tell you how that took place. I was in my early 20s and I was going out dating the daughter of a local Baptist minister. Now, I was certainly not a Christian. I'd grown up in a non-Christian home, but with very caring and loving parents. And church was totally outside my experience. But I knew her father was not very pleased about his daughter going out with me. But to keep the peace, on occasions, I went along to church. And I felt I ought to go along to church on Easter day. I didn't go in the morning, but I went to the Easter day evening service. Now the service normally started at 6.30, um, but I crept in at seven o'clock. I crept in at seven o'clock because I didn't like the first half hour, which was basically singing hymns from the 19th and early 20th century music style I did not like. You have to remember, on the previous night, I'd been playing in a band, playing Eric Clapton songs and Status Quo songs and Dire Strait songs, and uh, church music did very little for me. So there I am, listening to this man begin his sermon at seven o'clock on Easter Sunday evening. And what he did on that particular night, he marshaled together all the uh, evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. He went through it bit by bit, the gospel stories, how the disciples had radically changed from being scared men after the death of resurrection, after, after the, the crucifixion of Jesus. After his resurrection, they became bold and uh, joyful, and they went out to a whole known world and preached the death and resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection transformed them. And the, the early church, the resurrection took central place in, in lots of their activities, in their songs, and uh, so on. And he went through all this, and I sat there kind of mesmerized in a sense. I listened intently because it all started to make sense to me. And at the end of this particular sermon, I still remember the words 40 odd years on, uh, and he said this, in the resurrection of Jesus, God Almighty confronts us with shattering directness. I think originally they were the words of a man called John Stott, a well-known Anglican writer and uh, preacher. And uh, so those words he ended with. And I found myself sitting basically in the back row of the church, thinking to myself, all this makes sense. I was convicted of the, the reality of the resurrection of Jesus, that it did happen. But then a, a doubt came into my mind very quickly. If that's true, and I have to become a Christian to embrace that truth, I'm gonna to have to make a lot of changes in my life. I'm going to have to change my behavior, uh, my attitudes, my values. I'm gonna to have to turn everything upside down. And I knew that that would be a big challenge. I knew that deep down, was I really willing to, um, to make that, that, that change? And then a voice came into my mind as I was beginning to kind of walk away from the conviction of the Spirit about the resurrection of Jesus. A voice came into my mind saying, whatever you do with the evidence before you, Charles, it does not change the fact that what you have heard is the truth, the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. And that, that moment, as it were, I gave in to God. I had to spend a lot of time thinking through all the theology of the cross, why did Jesus die, the resurrection of Jesus, the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, all those kind of things I had to work my way through. And I did find church quite difficult because of the, the very different style of music and how things were done. But God, by his grace, got me through that first year and a half and uh, cut a long story short, uh, I got baptised in that time and uh, got involved in church life. I was an accountant, but after a couple of years I decided that God did not want me in the accountancy profession for all my life. I went to theological college, got a degree in theology, 
and then became a minister in the Baptist denomination. And that's where I've been ever since. So, a story, it's Professor Jode, a testimony. Over the past 15 years or so, I've been reading a lot uh, of books and articles and listening to lectures and sermons by a well-known uh, theologian called uh, N.T. Wright. He was the Bishop of Durham for many, many years. He went to, I think, Aberdeen University, um, no, St. Andrews University in Scotland, and is now back in Oxford uh, doing what he's, he does best, preaching and teaching uh, to um, vast audiences. N.T. Wright has a very interesting um, understanding of the resurrection of Jesus. And it's this, that the resurrection of Jesus is not just about life after death for the believers of, of Jesus. It's much more than that. Yes, at one level, it's about life after death. We have hope for the future. But N.T. Wright talks about the resurrection of Jesus in a much broader sense. He sees a resurrection of Jesus as God's first step in the renewal of the whole of creation. Not just individual people, but renewal of the whole of creation. And he majors much about the Old Testament, talking about the, the new heaven and the new earth. And uh, Wright says that in the resurrection of Jesus, we have God's new creation bursting forth in this resurrection of Jesus. And uh, he talks about it in, in such terms that when I read his writings and I see the resurrection of Jesus and I see God's promise of a new heaven and a new earth, I, I, I see the resurrection of Jesus in that kind of context. Yes, for individuals, hope for the future, but a hope for the whole of creation. Now, last week I did a, a funeral and um, strange funeral because just six people in the congregation and me in the front there because of all the coronavirus um, restrictions. But I always end funerals with the words from the book of Revelation John, that John wrote, John 21, uh, Revelation 21, where it talks about new heaven and new earth. And in this new heaven and new earth, there's going to be no sea. And the sea was always a symbol for chaos that could not be controlled. But there's going to be none of that chaos. There's going to be no death. There's going to be no tears. None of the things that uh, harm us today in our world as it is at the moment, none of those things will be in that new heaven and that new earth. And that's the end goal. The whole of creation, the whole of humanity renewed. And the resurrection of Jesus, for me, starts that whole process. God's new creation, God's renewal of all things. I hope that encourages you on this Easter Sunday. God bless you. Amen. Our youth have been busy creating a dance for us to watch this week. Um, Isabella has choreographed it and then several other people have done their own dances to videos that's all been mixed in by Dan. So thank you, Dan, for editing this together and also for reproducing the music for us. Enjoy. God only knows what you've been through. God only knows what 
So we've come to the end of our service and I'm just going to close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you came to this earth to show us who you are. Thank you that you died on the cross so that we could have a relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that you are alive, that you are guiding us, that you're providing for us and that you're giving us a hope for the future. I pray, Lord, that you would be revealed to those people who are watching this who don't know you. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would convict their hearts and that they would call out to you to ask who you are and start that journey to get to know you better. Amen. We're just going to close with some photos from people watching the live stream. And I hope to see you again next week. Thank you for sharing and watching.